Uh, special thanks to, to Larry for reaching out and asking me to uh, be part of the uh, TFI Technology Conference. Uh, so again, yeah, I'm Jeff Baumgartner, Senior Editor at uh, Light Reading. My coverage uh, tends to focus uh, primarily on uh, the cable industry and all it's up to from a service and technology standpoint, but also kind of keeping uh, tabs on uh, industry regulations, uh, you know, at least the big issues uh, that they're facing. Um, but I also try to keep tabs on, excuse me, what's going on with uh, pay TV and the, and the broader uh, video industry, as well as uh, some of what the telcos and, and the wireless companies are doing um, with respect to competition with uh, the cable operators and how um, mobile and fiber and, and, um, and wireless are competing and in some cases complementing uh, what the cable guys are up to. Uh, so for today's talk, I'm going to provide a pretty high level look at uh, kind of the state of U.S. broadband. So um, again, the broad picture is um, we're, we're going to kind of I'm going to try to cover a lot of ground, but uh, this is just going to kind of give you a general sense of the topics that um, we're going to be uh, hitting on today. Um, the uh, one thing Larry asked me to do is talk a little bit about the impact of the, the pandemic on on the broadband industry with respect to, to traffic and, and speeds. And we're going to like look at uh, some of the subscriber trends. Um, and uh, we're going to take a little bit of a uh, dive into um, the cable access network and how it's evolving. Um, <coughs> access 4.0 and uh, this other project called 10G that's been underway for a couple of years. Uh, talk quickly about some of the things that are driving broadband adoption and usage, uh, the relationship between uh, the cable industry and uh, 5G, and where their friends, where their foes, um, kind of how the, uh, uh, the evolution of the cable network is kind of moving toward kind of this uh, agnostic nature and into network and service convergence. Uh, I'm going to talk real quickly about RDOF, you know, and how it might relate, uh, particularly with uh, cable getting pretty active. Uh, we're going to look at some other uh, emerging broadband alternatives like uh, 5G. We're going to uh, talk a little bit about the LEO-based satellite services out there. Um, I'm going to do also a quick thing, just kind of a little update on uh, fiber to the prem. So, so let's talk a little bit about how the, um, the pandemic has impacted uh, U.S. broadband. Uh, I'm, I'm first just going to share a snapshot of uh, some studies and information that tries to pinpoint uh, some of the impact on uh, broadband consumption, uh, which is obviously, you know, shot up during the period as um, people have been forced to work and, and school from home, which is in turn putting greater demands on the, uh, the residential networks around the country. And the first chart here is uh, from Open Vault. It's a company that based its, uh, bases its data on uh, uh, studies using an, um, anonymous data from a, uh, a number of different ISPs around the country, including a lot of um, cable operators. Uh, so there's kind of the, the Q3 2020 data uh, that gives you a sense of the general usage uh, when one compares it to uh, customers on usage-based billing uh, broadband data plans, so those with uh, <clears throat> data caps. Uh, there's also an average weighted that gets uh, service from ISPs that um, uh, use flat rate or uh, limited uh, data policy. So as you can see, um, the, the usage year over year has spiked uh, pretty much across the board, but uh, really it start, started to flatten out uh, in the second and uh, third quarter of the year. So I'm going to show you some other data in a bit that, um, you know, we're kind of seeing uh, another spike in peak demand uh, in some recent weeks. But um, there's another point um, here is that the, the average usage among uh, people on flat rate billing is a bit higher than those on kind of those stricter uh, usage-based policies, which, you know, I suppose you'd expect, you know, since it, it means that those people need to be a little more mindful and careful, you know, about how, how much data uh, they're consuming. So another, um, we're kind of sticking with the, uh, the Q3 study from Open Vault here. And uh, this chart kind of illustrates how a group of, uh, you know, so-called power users 
Uh, they define them as uh, those that uh, chew up you know, more than a terabyte in a given month. And you know, that, that group's slowly growing. I mean, the percentage is uh, fairly similar, whether it's for uh, a customer on a usage based billing or a flat rate uh, billing uh, product. And uh, you know, those, although the, uh, the overall percentages are still uh, kind of a sliver of the total base, uh, the category itself is really growing uh, relatively fast given that it's, you know, it started from uh, practically zero. Um, but according to Open Vault here, you know, the power user category represents about 8.8% of the weighted average. And uh, uh, that's like up 100% from like 4.2% uh, in Q3 2019. And then the extreme power users, th those that um, are eating like two terabytes uh, or more per month, it's quite a bit, uh, only represent about 1% of the category, but it's actually up from like 0.36% uh, about a year ago. So we're talking about like a, an increase of um, like 172%. So again, just kind of a relative increase. Um, so here's a little bit more data, uh, again, from Open Vault that, that gives a snapshot of uh, where things stand. Um, the bulk of the provisioned speeds are still between 50 megabits per second to uh, 200 megabits per second. Um, we are seeing uh, provisioned uh, one gig speeds uh, start to make a dent uh, with about five, a little bit over 5% of those study kind of getting that, that level of speed. And that's a year on year increase of about 124%. Um, it's not noted here, but um, Altis USA um, cable operator uh, oven, uh, has got a pretty heavy emphasis in uh, New York and Connecticut, New Jersey, and some uh, rural uh, areas around the US. Uh, back in Q3, they reported like 60% of their new fiber to the premises uh, uh, gross broadband uh, customers took the one gig product. So some momentum there, um, but really the average uh, downstream speed hovers at about one, uh, 179 megabits per second and just 13 megabits per second in the upstream. Um, so there's a lot of the, the customers kind of measured for this study are on uh, cable. So it's very uh, asymmetric, you know, very uh, downstream heavy. Um, now we're gonna take a closer look at um, uh, a more focused view anyway of uh, peak data demand on US cable operator networks. Uh, this is according to the, uh, the NCTA uh, COVID-19 dashboard. And what, what that does is they, they're tabulating uh, data from several uh, U.S. cable operators, including Altice USA, Comcast, Cox, uh, some mid-sized ones, uh, Cable One, you know, Charter, another big one, GCI, uh, Mediacom, uh, Midco, and a very and a smaller one in Minnesota called uh, Showbergs. So as you can see, with um, uh, both upstream and downstream demand really shot up um, in March 2020, kind of when uh, you know, the pandemic was taking hold and and, and people were uh, you know, there were, there were uh, stay at home orders and so forth. Um, but then you saw it kind of level out uh, during the summer. And then in the fall when uh, school picked up, you know, things started to rise again. And, uh, you know, upstream usage really, uh, when you look at the latest batch of data though, like it's for some reason it's kind of stepped down a bit. But, but the overall uh, peak growth in the upstream has risen about 41%, uh, 41.5 and 34.7 in the downstream as of uh, January 2nd, uh, 2021, you know, compared to, uh, you know, when they started tracking this back in uh, March, 2020. Um, now here I'm gonna highlight um, some research uh, from the Fiber Broadband Association with um, RBA research that, uh, that was based on about 2000 random US uh, internet users. The first chart, I mean, it's not really a secret <laughs> that the use of uh, video conferencing has uh, skyrocketed. I mean, it's what we're doing today, you know, here during the pandemic. But you know, I think the chart really illustrates uh, the kind of uh, hockey stick um, growth that we're, we've seen. Um, but it's kind of broken a little bit further down by category. You know, family-related uh, usage has really surged. I think even you know, within my own family, you know, we're trying to get everybody on Zoom calls and so forth. But um, we've also seen 
some heavy increases among uh, business users, uh, healthcare, and of course, uh, school and education. You know, my, my kids are on conference calls, video calls all day, practically it feels. And then, um, you know, this chart shows a little more amplified view of uh, video conferencing among uh, a couple of individual groups, uh, business and education. Again, I mean, not a huge surprise, but it does give us, um, this kind of illustrate uh, the impact, you know, during the period. Um, now, if anyone benefited, you know, from the, the pandemic, I mean, it's definitely been the broadband service industry. Um, yeah, it's, it's a little hard to see, I know, but, uh, you know, the left side uh, shows some, uh, the residential penetration rate, uh, which has been continuing to rise, and I think it was at 84%. At last check, and, and this is according to the uh, Moffitt Nathanson folks. And uh, meanwhile, total broadband subscriber growth, uh, you know, you can see how it uh, spiked up 4.7% um, as ISPs uh, really saw a demand uh, surge, you know, among, you know, those that, that hadn't really been connected yet. So uh, we're going to have a couple more slides on the, on the pandemic impact, but this is a, uh, again, from Moffitt Nathanson, uh, more of a granular view of how the uh, the cable operators and telcos have fared uh, from a broadband subscriber standpoint uh, during the pandemic. And you know, as you can see, the, the rate of uh, broadband growth has uh, has gone up, you know, among cable operators uh, pretty sizably. And then, you know, the U.S. telcos, they did see some demand uh, rise, but uh, not enough to the point where they really have gotten out of the red. Um, but as a group, I mean, they're definitely getting close as uh, particularly as companies like Verizon and AT&T uh, continue to, um, you know, phase out or reduce their uh, DSL uh, subscriber footprint and, and really put more emphasis on uh, uh, fiber to the prem based services. Um, so the, the Q4 2020 results are going to be coming out. Uh, we have a lot of stuff that's going to come out next week. Um, so really what we have to go off of is what we saw in the third quarter. Um, but this is a snapshot. Um, you know, cable did pretty well, as I said, that 4.7% growth. Uh, the telcos almost flat, you know, it was a small loss, but, um, you know, fiber to the prem offset most of the DSL erosion. Uh, we're going to talk about satellite broadband a little bit later. Uh, they're flat, you know, they're just 1.8 billion subscribers altogether. So that's less than 2% of the market. And, uh, you know, some of the analysts that, that, um, that we've been covering expect a little bit of a, a slowdown in the rate of broadband subscriber growth in 2021, because I think what happened in uh, in 2020, you know, the pandemic had this pull pull through effect, where a lot of people who maybe um, would be waiting or you know wouldn't be jumping on so soon, uh, you know, got in there with uh, with broadband service. Um, now I want to focus a little bit um, on what what the uh, the cable operators have been doing uh, and kind of responding to you know the upstream demand. Um, that you saw in that uh, NCTA uh, chart, because really, I mean, the upstream has kind of been the um, uh, kind of the weakest link of the uh, the, the hybrid uh, uh, the hybrid fiber coax network. It's very downstream heavy, but um, yeah, you know, I mean, but for the most part, though, uh, most U.S. operators have uh, been able to stay ahead of the demand with respect to the uh, the, the residential HFC networks. And uh, while some projects like uh, network virtualization and uh, some distributed access network activity has kind of slowed or maybe been uh, mothballed a little bit or sidelined, um, they still haven't been standing still. So I'm just going to kind of give you a little bit of a list of what, what they've been up to. Um, you know, the first one there, they've been boosting their existing capacity. Now, this is more or less about uh, buying more line cards, software licenses for their uh, existing access network gear. Uh, we're seeing some, um, some of them pull fiber deeper and split nodes. And uh, really what those moves do is they provide a little more capacity uh, per home in a given uh, service group. So that's, you know, it's pretty common even before the pandemic. Um, we've seen some work in um, artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, come about to kind of help optimize the network. Uh, one Prime example has been Comcast. Uh, you know, they they fast tracked a uh, an AI based technology that they call Octave, and it's a technology that helps them give more. Um, they get more 
uh, network data efficiency. And it's the way that they explained it to me is uh, Octave can quickly uh, pinpoint um, you know, network anomalies and uh, noise related issues. Uh, and, and they use like polling and analyzing, uh, they're analyzing data, data from gateways and modems. And uh, the, the net result though, is that they, they, uh, they can be able to increase both their, uh, their downstream and upstream uh, capacity. Um, and then when I mentioned again on the upstream, you know, we're seeing a lot of uh, interest in pickup uh, around these, uh, these moves that we call uh, mid splits and high split upgrades. And effectively what they do is they, uh, they increase the amount of spectrum that's dedicated to the, uh, the upstream. Uh, you know, typically or kind of traditionally, the North American cable operators have carved out um, an, an amount of spectrum in, five to, in the five to 42 megahertz uh, range. And um, you know, some are looking to do like a mid split, um, which would raise that to 85 and you know, almost effectively double it. And there's some that are doing, uh, looking at what's called a high split and you know, where you jump it all the way to uh, 204 megahertz. Um, and then meanwhile, some operators are also doing some, uh, some prep work uh, for a new specification called uh, DOCSIS 4.0 uh, by installing some future-proofed uh, passives and amplifiers. Um, and there's some vendors that are getting to work on uh, some new modems and some other access network products uh, for the new specs. And we know that um, you know, broadband's going, or the, the demand for data and broadband you know, has been going up, but um, you know, just during the pandemic, you know, but um, as people work in school from home, entertain themselves at home. Um, but I wanted to add just a quick word on some of the apps and services that are driving uh, some of that usage uh, during this period. Um, you know, the first obvious one is the, uh, the continued uh, popularity of premium uh, streaming services that have only become uh, more popular during the pandemic as people entertain themselves at home. Um, some notable players include, um, excuse me, HBO Max, which um, I don't know if everyone's aware of this or has seen, but uh, you know, Warner Brothers uh, attached to, which runs HBO Max, uh, they're going to they're going to bring their whole slate of new movies um, in that uh, subscription uh, VOD window, um, along with the uh, the release in theaters. So that that's going to drive uh, some people that direction. You know, Disney Plus, you know, pretty much exploded on the scene. Uh, Peacock from uh, NBC Universal and Comcast is out there. Um, and then one about the launch uh, next month. I'm sorry, in March is uh, Paramount Plus, uh, which is a service from Viacom and CBS. And that's gonna effectively um, replace CBS All Access. Um, some other drivers, online gaming, um, particularly with um, respect to big game downloads. Um, I know my kids are uh, big data usage uh, in our household. Um, you know, a, lot of, a lot of that's attributed to them. Um, but you know, teleconferencing we've touched on. Uh, another thing we're keeping an eye on is um, AR and VR, uh, which are, I think are still kind of trying to live up to the hype, but um, uh, they're likely going to have an impact on uh, overall data usage, uh, as well as the need for uh, low latency networks. Um, so here I want to talk a little bit about kind of how, how we got from uh, there to here with respect to uh, DOCSIS, which is the uh, uh, the uh, the specifications from Cable Labs that, that underpin the uh, the IP vert, uh, part of the uh, the HFC network for broadband data services, as well as uh, uh, some of the IP video services that we're seeing. Um, so it's just an evol evolutionary path. Um, the dates I'm using here, uh, kind of on each step along the, the evolutionary path, uh, are kind of squishy, <laughs> you know. But I'm going to give you. It does kind of give you a general sense of how the era has uh, shaped up during the years. Um, so the one up there now, DOCSIS 1.0, primarily used, um, uh, focused on the use of single QAM uh, channel for data, like a six megahertz wide channel for North American DOCSIS. And uh, they used uh, eight megahertz wide in Europe. Um, so generally this enabled uh, cable operators to offer 
few megabits per second on a uh, like an always on connection that, that really just blew away um, all the dial up services at the time. Uh, Doxis 1.1, uh, when that came out, the big thing there was it added uh, quality of service and put uh, the cable operators on a path toward uh, services like voice over IP. Doxis 2.0 um, was still a, a single channel technology, but put a little more emphasis on enhancing the upstream uh, using a couple of techniques um, like SCDMA and TDMA. And back then, I remember one of the, um, the big potential drivers for 2.0, or at least one of the big concerns that was driving it was um, uh, the emergence of uh, the sling box, if you remember that. And what that did is it was a little device, connected it to your uh, set-top box, took the video out of your set-top box, flipped it into an IP stream, sent it upstream, and off to the uh, wherever you were on your PC or eventually a mobile device. So the, the fear was that it was gonna put a lot of uh, strain on the upstream. Um, it did not, you know, the sling box did okay. I mean, but it wasn't like this, this massive mainstream phenomena. So really what it did is it put a big scare in them, but uh, didn't amount to too much um, from an overall impact. Now, Doxis 3.0, um, this introduced uh, IPv6 and it was the first uh, spec in the batch to bond uh, multiple six megahertz channels. And initially the, the idea was to bond enough of them together to produce, I think it was like four was the, the minimum. And it was enough to produce um, or get you to like hundred megabits per second. Um, so, but a lot of the initial uh, focus for 3.0 was in the downstream direction. Um, up upstream channel bonding came a little bit later the, some operators even today are using uh, enough channels of 3.0 to get up to a gigabit. Um, now 3.1, um, this is um, where we are today. It's more focused on helping uh, cable operators get to a gig and maybe a little bit more through the more efficient use of uh, the spectrum um, and some new forward error correct, uh, correction schemes and some other uh, additions that um, uh, helped uh, bring a little more efficiency and pump more data out of the uh, the network. However, the modems were uh, hybrids in the sense that they could use both 3.0 and 3.1 channels. And again, that's where we are today. And then uh, where we're going next is a spec called uh, DOCSIS 4.0. And I want to spend a little more time on that one. Now, the... Um, kind of the shiny new thing <laughs> with uh, the kind of advance the, uh, the capabilities of the, uh, the HFC network. Um, the, um, uh, they were completed last year, the specs, but um, the, the idea though is to enable a platform that can deliver about uh, 10 gigabits per second in the downstream and six in the upstream. Um, a lot of it has to do with um, uh, boosting the amount of spectrum that's gonna be available on the, uh, the HFC uh, network. There's some key additions to support uh, low latency uh, applications like uh, online gaming and enhanced uh, security. Um, there, there are a couple of... Uh, okay, well, I, I, I have... Uh, oh, sorry, I thought somebody was jumping in. Uh, there's a couple of flavors of DOCSIS 4.0 that I wanna talk about. Um, there's full duplex. Uh, Doxis. The idea here is to allow uh, upstream and downstream traffic to operate um, on plant that's built out to like 1.2 uh, gigahertz. Comcast has been the, uh, the the primary champion of that approach. And then we've got um, extended spectrum Doxis, and this is where a lot of the other operators are looking. You know, it kind of keeps the upstream and the downstream flows uh, separate, like they are today. And uh, they use dedicated uh, spectrum for each. And uh, most, most of that's been um, you know, focused on um, uh, 1.8 1, 1 gigahertz building the plant way up there. And, uh, and there's already been some work done on um, maybe a future spec, maybe a 4.1 that would raise that all the way up to three uh, gigahertz and really kind of extend the road for uh, HFC in, in the, uh, well into the future, kind of beyond where we even uh, 
you know, for a, 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 probably a decade or more. Now, one quick point on the timing. Um, you know, last we heard, uh, the first prototype products for Doctors 4.0 could show up maybe this year uh, with some certifications to follow in uh, 2022 and then maybe get into uh, some deployments after that. Uh, the good news is that uh, the industry is not really in a massive rush uh, to do that. Uh, to do that, there's this belief that uh, among a lot of the, the, uh, the engineers that I've been in touch with that 3.1 you know, offers a few years of runway before 4.0 would really be uh, truly needed. So, um, so 4.0 also re represents kind of the HFC variant of a uh, broader initiative that uh, is called 10G. So I want to talk a little bit about that. You may have heard about it, but um, uh, for starters, it was introduced uh, back at the 29, uh, 2019 CES. Uh, no one would really say it out loud back then, but a big part of the timing was to kind of steal the thunder of um, what 5G was bringing to the show. Uh, but in general terms, you know, it's um, an access network agnostic approach that includes support for uh, HFC, fiber to the prem, uh, even wireless networks, um, the pursuit of symmetrical 10 gigabit per second um, speeds along with enhanced uh, security and lower latency. Again, some of the hallmarks we saw with uh, DOCSIS 4.0. Um, and then there was some, uh, I wanna point out that um, there was some 10G uh, facing activities last year uh, to talk about uh, Mediacom, Cable Labs and NCTA got together and did this uh, 10G smart home demo out in uh, Ames, Iowa. And it was effectively a plant that was built out to like 1.2 gigahertz. So uh, before that, a lot of it was uh, 750 megahertz, 860 up to one gig. Um, but they're using a high split for the upstream. You know, one of the things we talked about and, um, and part of the demo was to show some of the apps and uh, services that uh, serv uh, technology like this could support. Um, they, they were talking about things like 8K video. They did a demo. There's a picture of it here of um, a light field display uh, there in the, on the desk. And what it is, it's like a holographic-like technology that's going to require massive amounts of data and very low latency. Uh, you know, the kind of application that's uh, 10G uh, or a perfect example for 10, that some of the 10G could do. Um, and then Comcast did a, uh, a test out in uh, Jacksonville, Florida last fall, um, where they were testing symmetrical 1.25 gigabits on the HFC network um, uh, and using like a virtualized network. Uh, it was kind of a stepping stone really, you know, because 1.25, you know, we're uh, symmetrical is a little bit below <laughs> where we're we're with what they're shooting for with 10G, but uh, again, it was more of a, um, a sign of progress. So when you kind of put all that together, um, when you talk about 10G and, and especially the, the access network agnostic uh, nature to it, it also squares pretty well with a, a broader plan for operators to uh, converge their networks and also the services as they continue to um, deliver wireline services and pursue uh, wireless and mobile services. Um, John Chapman, the guy I've known for many years over at Cisco, I mean, he had a great line uh, for a talk that he gave at the Cable Tech Expo last fall that kind of sums it up. I and mean, he just said that today's cable operators are tomorrow's mobile operators. And, you know, it's kind of hard not to disagree. I mean, there's there are many uh, cable operators around the world that um, are already mobile network operators. And, um, and then the US, we're seeing a lot of major, some of the major guys um, launch mobile services using uh, MVNO deals. You know, Comcast and Charter had the MVNO with uh, Verizon. Altice USA uh, has launched a service using uh, an MVNO with Sprint, which has since uh, converted over to T-Mobile after the merger between uh, Sprint and T-Mobile happened. And, uh, you know, they're making some progress. I mean, together, they ended the third quarter of last year with almost 5 million total lines. And uh, I think U.S. cable operators that you drove 
about 33% of uh, mobile subscriber growth in that quarter. And that's according to Moffitt Nathanson. So, I mean, they're definitely becoming, you know, more of a, um, a, a relevant player in this uh, mobile arena. And then um, we're also keeping an eye on what they're doing with license spectrum, um, uh, particularly using it in like high traffic areas where they can benefit the most and kind of try to get some of these, uh, uh, what they're kind of calling uh, uh, buyers economics or owners economics, I'm sorry. So, and Charter and Comcast are among the first uh, or those that have been one CBRS spectrum. And uh, they're also involved in the, uh, the bidding for C-band spectrum, which is um, kind of more in that mid-band spectrum. And uh, the auction just ended for the C-band, so we should know the winners here in the coming weeks. Um, and then, you know, just kind of bigger picture, you know, how this, what this means is, um, you know, it's clear that, uh, you know, this is not the quote unquote cable industry anymore. I mean, it's all about, you know, connectivity uh, now led with uh, broadband rather than uh, pay TV. So broadband becoming the central driver for the entire business and, and really the operator's relationship with the customer. So. That's been a big change. Um, one big, one good example was how Comcast kind of spelled that out with this uh, set of core tenets that they uh, talked about a few months ago. And again, broadband's the top one, um, content aggregation. So that's not just through PTV service, but integrating uh, over the top services. And then uh, Comcast is also getting very active with, um, uh, from a platform perspective, um, with its uh, X1 and uh, Flex platforms. I think they want to start to uh, uh, explore opportunities to integrate that with uh, smart TVs and take on companies like Roku and uh, uh, Amazon uh, Fire TV and Android TV. Um, now here I thought it would make sense to offer a little bit of a snapshot of um, you know, what's going on in pay TV, you know, now that it's not as uh, as much of a core focus for the cable guys. Uh, you know, generally speaking, um, um, you know, most traditional pay TV providers are losing subscribers, even as they gain uh, higher margin uh, broadband customers. Uh, this is some third quarter, uh, in the third quarter, some, some players like, uh, uh, you know, the, the traditional guys, the cable operators, the telcos, satellite TV, I mean, they lost almost one and a half million video customers, uh, while the virtual MVPDs, which include, you know, YouTube TV, Sling TV, uh, Hulu's got a product like that. Um, I mean, they really bounced back and uh, in the quarter and added uh, 1.48. So when you kind of put it together, you have like a net gain of 30,000. So pretty flat overall. But um, from the cable operator side, I mean, Charter's been able to kind of buck the trend uh, the last couple of quarters and gain uh, video subscribers largely attributed to the uh, the pull through that they got from um, all the blowout ads that they had from the broadband side um, that maybe came in and added video to the bundle. But I would like to um, mention how cable operators have been responding to this. Um, I talked a little bit about it on the previous slide, but um, operators like Comcast and Charter, uh, they've built out or they've built uh, kind of a next-gen platform that offers their uh, usual, you know, their traditional pay TV product while also tying in uh, over-the-top services, uh, doing a lot of cross-content search. And in the case of uh, Comcast with X1, uh, they added a, a voice remote. And um, generally, they're kind of chasing after, you know, high-value customers and, and kind of keeping churn and check rather than chasing after this, this group of customers that um, will churn out, you know, and they're kind of uh, bouncing around to different promotions. So they're, they're kind of not doing these deep discounts anymore just to save them. Um, the, um, then the other thing I wanted to point out is that um, others are partnering uh, for next gen services. Um, Cox was one example they launched uh, version of its service um, that relies on X1 with Comcast, kind of a syndication relationship. And then others have uh, partnered with um, companies like Mobi, Mobi TV, 
uh, TiVo, Evolution Digital, the launch um, IP streaming services. And a lot of those are, are kind of utilizing uh, this Android TV operator tier um, that kind of boots up to the, um, the operator's pay TV app and then integrates OTT apps and, and services from the Google Play Store. Uh, you know, it's starting to gain a lot of momentum. Uh, the example I put up here is uh, Wide Open West. Um, you know, they have a, a new Android TV box out there for this new streaming service, but they're also promoting uh, services like YouTube TV and Philo. Uh, so, but, but they're uh, definitely focused on broadband. So others uh, have kind of de-emphasized or even eliminated uh, pay TV altogether. I mean, one example of that latter extreme is a company called Build uh, Internet, and they're a, a municipal out in uh, Braintree, Massachusetts. And they got out of the pay TV business in December uh, you know, just last month, you know, because programming costs you know, are getting out of control uh, for a lot of these smaller guys. And instead, you know, they're kind of steering their broadband customers um, to the various OTT services uh, and kind of giving customers that is to kind of fulfill their, uh, their video needs. So here, I'm just going to provide a quick overview you know, 5G. Um, you know, I know Mike last year was all over this, but uh, uh, you know, just if you had to boil it down, it's more about faster speeds, lower latency, uh, spectrum agnostic. You know, there's um, you know, they're using all sorts of spectrum bands using licensed and uh, and unlicensed uh, spectrum, and this this notion of spectrum uh, slicing. You know, the idea is to segment the, the physical network into a virtual networks for uh, specific services and functions. You know, you could do it just for mobile broadband or IOT or some critical, you know, low latency apps and services. Um, you know, when, you know, there's a, a good example with um, uh, self-driving cars, you know, I mean, Waymo, uh, it's come out, so it kind of comes out of, um, you know, Google's par parent company, Alphabet. Uh, there's a lot of money behind this stuff, but, you know, that would be a, definitely like a critical application, you know, if you're using it for uh, uh, to drive around. So if I'm a, a cable operator, uh, you know, it's definitely both uh, friend and foe when I look at uh, 5G. But I'd also argue that it's more friend uh, than foe, um, kind of in the network and uh, service convergence age. So as a, as a fixed wireless option, I mean, it's a potential competitor um, to the home Cable, the uh, cable's home broadband product. Uh, there's a couple of examples here. You know, Verizon's 5G home uh, product. Uh, T-Mobile has a fixed wireless offering. Uh, again, just a couple of prime examples. Um, I don't, I don't see these um, services as like appending or dramatically disrupting um, the wireline, the wireline home broadband market. But you know, something that cable operators um, definitely can't and won't ignore. Um, there, there was something that just came out, it was just yesterday, I think Verizon, there was an analyst at uh, Bernstein, and they were predicting that, uh, you know, their 5G home uh, to reach about 2 million homes passed by year's end. So, so they're getting some scale. Um, but when I look at uh, 5G, if I'm a cable operator, it's definitely a friend. I mean, there's a lot of benefits uh, that make it that way. Um, you know, distributed 5G small cells, uh, kind of look a little bit like HFC, you know, and uh, in, in terms of how they're uh, deployed out in the network, uh, cable operators can use 5G to deliver uh, services in areas that uh, aren't reached by the wireline networks. Um, so, so in addition to being a competitor, you can use it to your advantage. Uh, there's some potential benefit to um, have the cable operator supply, you know, the network power and, and the backhaul. Uh, for a lot of these 5G networks that maybe the telcos or the, the, the mobile service provider does not have. Um, and then Comcast, Charter, Altice USA, you know, you said they all have MVNO deals. And um, because of that, they do get uh, to take advantage of the, uh, the 5G mobile networks that are being built out without having to actually build it themselves. So uh, as far as I can, I'll, I wanted to talk a little bit about alternative uh, alternatives that have been that have been out there or 
are emerging. Um, definitely going to get a lot of attention here in the months ahead. So I thought it makes sense to offer a little bit of a snapshot of what's going on. Um, now, geo satellites. I mean, here I'm referring to um, uh, high orbit satellites that are orbiting about uh, 22,000 miles uh, above. I mean, they've been used to support your residential broadband in largely uh, rural areas, as well as to provide uh, connectivity to, uh, to airlines uh, and cruise ships. I mean, some pros, they can, they can cover a wide area uh, with, uh, you know, just one, one or two satellites up there. And, um, and it still delivers some decent speeds. I mean, some of the, the newer services like Viasat's um, uh, latest years, I mean, they're up to 100 megabits per second, HughesNet's looking at something like that. Uh, but the Achilles heel uh, for, for these has been uh, latency, which means, you know, they're not very good at uh, supporting apps like online gaming and, and video teleconferencing. Um, and again, we talked about the subscribers. Uh, they still kind of hit a small segment of the consumer broadband market, but um, they definitely have, have found their niche. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about medium Earth orbit. Um, we're talking satellites of around 5,000 miles up there, and they definitely require, they require fewer satellites for coverage. Um, or I'm sorry, a couple, a few more, I'm sorry, than uh, GEO. Uh, and they have some lower latencies, so kind of um, some benefits there. Now, an example, I don't see a lot of um, like direct-to-consumer services coming out of this category, but um, you know, SES has uh, a couple of constellations in this uh, medium Earth orbit uh, arena that are, aren't really for broadband or residential broadband, but uh, more for other segments like enterprise. Um, low Earth orbit is uh, one you probably have heard about lately, and it's been getting a lot of attention, a lot of hype. And, uh, you know, as the name implies, you know, the, they're placed in uh, lower orbits. There's something around 300 to 350 miles up. And uh, they also require uh, hundreds, if not thousands, of satellites to provide coverage. Um, in the case of Sp uh, SpaceX, or with um, with uh, Starlink, we're talking thousands. Um, but one one key differentiator is that uh, they do support lower latencies, so something in the neighbor of like uh, neighborhood of 50 millisecond uh, uh, milliseconds. So it's well below the 600 that we see with our, our friends over on the geo side. And uh, some examples include, I mentioned Starlink, um, part of SpaceX. Uh, there's the Cooper project over at Amazon. OneWeb is another. They recently got bought out of uh, bankruptcy and uh, HughesNet is one of their backers. Um, but the, you know, the LEO category isn't really without its controversy. Um, one thing, stargazers, are pretty upset that this multitude of uh, satellites are really cluttering uh, the sky and, and impairing their view. And uh, you know, Starlink is trying to uh, uh, kind of obviate that a little bit using these uh, visors that kind of make, that, that make the, the satellites less reflective and less visible to the, uh, the telescopes on the ground. Uh, meanwhile, Viasat's been giving it some static. <laughs> they had some some recent concerns they've been pressing over at the FCC um, about Starlink and, and their desire to, to move some satellites into some lower orbits. And, and they've been arguing that, um, uh, you know, LEOs in general and some of the plans underway are gonna make, uh, they're gonna be more prone to uh, collisions and the generation of uh, space debris and uh, other things that are troublesome. But, um, but Starlink, you know, is also viewed as kind of a potential uh, gap filler in unserved and uh, underserved markets. Uh, the initial beta tests are pretty promising uh, from a performance level, but we don't know yet if that performance is really going to carry through, you know, as uh, more and more customers uh, come on board once there's a commercial launch and the system itself gets a little more uh, loaded. But um, there's some numbers to share. Um, on, on uh, Starlink kind of in these early days, uh, PC Mag did some tests in the fall. And the, the speeds were, when they tested, went way up. I mean, it was around 
an average about almost 80 megabits per second, about 14 in the uh, in the up direction. Um, and the service for the beta was like $99 a month, but they still, the people still had to pay like 500 bucks uh, for the, the dish and the home router. So not, not exactly a uh, cheap option, uh, but uh, this is another chart, same, same study, uh, but, but it did show that there was a, uh, um, if you look at the performance comparison of the Starling beta versus Viasat and HughesNet with their, uh, their geo-based satellite broadband services, uh, you can see who's definitely way out in front there. Uh, so again, some decent numbers for Starlink, but um, we don't know yet how it's gonna be priced and, and packaged once it reaches that uh, commercial deployment level. Uh, so we're kind of in a wait and see mode um, from that standpoint. Um, I do wanna dig a little bit into uh, uh, fixed wireless. Uh, definitely a small and growing uh, segment includes, you know, we talked about Verizon, T-Mobile. Uh, there's a lot of uh, privately held wire, uh, wireless ISPs, uh, including um, an interesting uh, company in Boston called Starry and Google Fiber. If you know about them, I mean, they're, they're in this arena as well with their web pass acquisition. Uh, the subscriber numbers um, aren't really making much of a material impact yet, but uh, I think there's Definitely a lot of uh, uh, interest and potential momentum behind it. Uh, you know, some of them use a millimeter wave uh, spectrum, which has some some good and some very troubling uh, attributes. I mean, they definitely deliver uh, high speeds. You know, something um, that could rival or at least compete with um, wired broadband. But uh, they're also limited by uh, the distance and the propagation. Uh, so that kind of limits their applicability in some of the use cases. Um, at the same time, uh, fixed wireless is also gaining some attention from uh, the cable guys. Um, one prime example is Cable One has been rebranded as uh, Sparklight, but um, they invested in a couple of uh, fixed wireless ISPs, a company called Whisper and uh, Nextlink. So boiled down, you know, Cable One views this as an alternative way to uh, reach into less dense areas that maybe are adjacent to their wireline networks and maybe it's too expensive to to install to deploy to with a wire with a with a uh, fiber or with a with, with an hfc network so here i thought i'd give um just a few words um about the the fiber to the premises segment um i didn't want to completely ignore it um i checked with uh, jeff hanan over at the uh, the del oro group who, who kind of covers this a lot more closely than I do and kind of get some of his thoughts. And, you know, he noted that um, there's definitely this continued shift uh, to GPON and more fiber to the prem in general as uh, some of the telcos uh, move, kind of pivot some of their spending away from technologies like VDSL. Um, he says it's not like a wholesale shift right now, but one that's, that's kind of been given more urgency uh, during the pandemic. And he also highlighted the, uh, the World Digital Opportunity Fund as a, a catalyst. And then uh, as far as like from a specific technology perspective and, and kind of what's new and upcoming, um, there, there's some buzz around uh, XGS Pond in regions such as North America and, and certain parts of Europe. Uh, when I was talking to Jeff, you know, he thought that the telcos that didn't do uh, 2.5 gig G Pond will just skip over that and focus on XGS PON and uh, look toward uh, symmetrical 10 gig uh, capabilities. And you know, some of that momentum bears out in the, uh, the numbers uh, with, with port deployments. You can see the shipments are up. It's uh, up pretty big because you're kind of starting from a small number. So any additions are gonna uh, have a pretty good uh, impact on the, uh, the overall uh, growth. Um, so what I want to do, this is just going to be my last slide, and I thought I would do, uh, just add some info about the multi-billion dollar RDOF initiative that uh, we mentioned on the last uh, slide. Now, phase one just ended, and uh, Charter and SpaceX were among the, the big winners. Um, highlighting Charter, uh, yeah, qualified to receive about $1.2 in federal support for deployments 
uh, covering, as you can see, about a little bit over a million locations. Uh, some other cable operators, Cox, Atlantic Broadband, Midco, Mediacom, uh, Altice USA, a small company called Allen's TV Service, were among the other cable operators that got some wins in phase one. Uh, notably, Comcast sat it out, um, and then telcos like uh, CenturyLink, Windstream, Frontier, um, you know, they got some wins, but definitely not super aggressive in uh, phase one. Uh, so there's, um, well, there's a decent uh, sized amount of satellite broadband and fixed wireless winners in phase one. Um, I do expect the, uh, the broader result to spark some sizable uh, fiber deployments, you know, as those RDOF buildouts get underway here in the, uh, uh, the coming years. So, I um, mean, with that, I mean, that's where we're going to end things. I know we covered a lot of ground, but, um, you know, uh, I'm happy to try to answer any questions you might have. So, uh, so Larry, I'll stop the share here and I'll just hand it back to you. Okay. Thanks so much, Jeff. Excellent, excellent talk. I really appreciate it. Um, and put uh, any chat, any questions in the chat, uh, guys, and I'll, I'll keep an eye out for it. While we're waiting for that, uh, I had a question for you. Okay. Uh, you mentioned uh, under DOCSIS 4.0 um, going up to uh, three gigahertz technology. Mm -hmm. uh, I know you're not a technology guy per se, but uh, do you have any idea what's involved with the cable companies to, to go to three gigahertz? Yeah, so one, one thing they'll have to do is they'll have to prepare their plant to um, support spectrum um, up in that range. And, and what we're seeing now, we're starting to see some uh, some future proofing in this uh, uh, that could kind of uh, support like a three gigahertz upgrade. So as they start to deploy, you know, these passives, um, passive devices out in the network and some actives, uh, even though, you know, they're only gonna support maybe up to 1.8 gigahertz for the time being, um, a lot of the devices that they're gonna put out in the network to kind of prep for 4.0 will support 3.0, or I'm sorry, three gigahertz. So they're kind of future proof in the network for that, you know, to, to support um, uh, services in that uh, up in that region. Okay. I don't see any uh, questions in the uh, uh, chat yet. Uh, if somebody wants to just unmute themselves and ask a question, uh, we can try that. I've got another one. You mentioned uh, the uh, Starlink on their their beta uh, getting um, you know, pretty good uh, up and down speeds. Um, I wonder what happens when that gets congested, though, and whether those speeds are going to fall, and whether Starlink's going to really be able to uh, deliver on their their broadband claims. Have you heard anything on yeah. that? Yeah, I think that that's been that that's kind of the um, the other shoe you know that, that's going to drop with this service. Um, you know, like I think with any beta service that, that comes out, um, uh, it's kind of um, engineered to perform really, really well. And but you know, you don't really know how it's going to perform. Um, you know, once it becomes like a commercially deployed service, and we don't know yet how many uh, people are going to jump on board early on, and how it's going to load up the system. Uh, you know, and, and how is that going to affect the um, the number of satellites they got to put up there uh, to support that, uh, to get down to their, their ground systems. Um, I think it's more like wait and see. You know, I think that, um, you know, right, I think what they were trying to do here, at least with the beta, is kind of tell the, uh, the, the, uh, the FCC that they're capable of delivering a, you know, quote unquote broadband product in, in the way that is being defined by the, uh, the FCC right now uh, with a lot of uh, interest and plans to get money out of the uh, out of the RDOF auction. Okay. I have, I have a question. There, when you're going through those three um, orbits, there's a lower orbit yet that you would use uh, a plane or, or I, I don't know whether a satellite would work it, but and the antenna could cover a metropolitan area. So a lot of applications, companies that are in metropolitan areas could get 
uh, a one millisecond uh, response and which, which would make company meetings much more uh, human-like, tel telecom, teleconferences, for example. Any thought, anything being said about that? Um, you know, I haven't heard of anything like um, actually being, I mean, those are the, the three main areas that um, I've, I've seen main deployments um, with respect to like satellite based broadband. Um, but yeah, I'd have to look into it and see, yeah, you know, if there is like a super low, you know, earth orbit uh, plan, you know, or are you talking something that would be like more terrestrial? I muted you, Bill, because uh, I agree with some noise, so you don't need to unmute if you're answering. Okay, uh, I have a question from uh, Ruben Miranda, uh, Jeff. It says, do you see linear pay TV as a viable business model for any provider? Um, I think it, it's, it's um, not gonna completely go away. Uh, I think that what, what, you're, what we're starting to see is um, a lot of the, you know, the bundles we know it, uh, kind of unravel a little bit and kind of get reconstituted um, just because a lot of the, the contracts that the, uh, the cable operators and uh, other pay TV operators really have to uh, kind of bundle together. You know, if you want ABC, you got to get, you know, if you're dealing with Disney, you got to get ABC plus, you know, this whole uh, mix of channels and that really raises the, um, uh, the price on the uh, the packages, um, I, I think it'll be it'll be viable. I think I think that the um, uh, the migration or the path forward is going to be to um, smaller and um, uh, smaller packages that that are probably a lot more uh, flexible, you know, kind of skinnier bundles that um, uh, that kind of take the sports out and uh, you know people that want to pay for sports channels are just going to have to uh, pay up for those. But we're also starting to see bundles that kind of tie together all the uh, kind of the linear pay TV with a lot of the, um, uh, the subscription VOD services like Netflix and Disney Plus. And, and I think it's just going to be a reformation of the, uh, the package as we know it today. Any other questions before we go to the next thing? I have one, uh, I guess, final question for you, Jeff. And obviously, I'm super interested in this topic, so I could probably ask you yeah. questions all day long. Uh, but uh, you mentioned uh, some some holographic applications that might drive 10K. Um, there's also, of course, um, um, you know, we've gone from HD to 4K UHD TV. And then somewhere in the future, on the horizon, there's 8K uh, as you know, more than just a niche, perhaps. Uh, do you see anything on the, uh, on, the on that horizon uh, that would increase a, a bandwidth demand? For like uh, for 8K in particular, or this is 8K and other things like that. Yeah, um, you know, I think um, I think like looking at 4K for a number of years, and it's taken. Quite a number of years to the point where like 4K has become kind of the standard in the TV. If you go buy a TV today, I mean, it's like a lot of most of them are 4K capable, you know, and 8K is kind of the new uh, premium. Uh, I think you're, you still end up with kind of this chicken and egg problem um, with content availability. I mean, right now there's, you know, there's if you want to get an 8K set, there's not a lot of content to take advantage of the set that you bought and, and paid a premium for. Um, on the four, I think a lot, there's, there's a lot more activity ramping up with um, 4K and a lot of it is uh, access to on-demand content. There's still not a lot of live, live linear 4K content. You know, there's some one-offs here and there for, uh, for sporting events. But um, I mean, even the Super Bowl this year, they're not gonna do like a 4K stream, which is kind of uh, uh, disappointing. But um, you know, I think in the near term, you know, the next uh, 
three to five years, you know, you're going to see a lot more 4K content come out, including, you know, live linear, um, you know, 8K is a ways out. Now, the holographic stuff um, is, uh, I think, interesting from a, um, a demonstration standpoint. Um, but, you yeah, kind of the, uh, you, you need like a special display just for that. Um, uh, there's a lot of standards being developed for content, uh, you know, kind of with the, the, these light field displays. But, uh, you know, I, I kind of put that out in the, uh, the 8K and beyond, you know, sort of horizon oh, from a consumer adoption standpoint. Okay, we've got um, one last question and uh, uh, we'll, then we'll uh, go to something else. Uh, it says Comcast or Charter, in your opinion, which is more competitively positioned? Well, I think is um, if you look at the valuations <laughs> right now and kind of where the stocks are and kind of what they're doing, I think right now, I think Charter kind of has um, an advantage because, you know, they're more of a uh, pure play um, uh, uh, service provider, right? And really focus on broadband and, you know, they've been knocking it out of the park from a subscriber standpoint, a lot of the recent quarters. And I think that they're getting rewarded by that. Um, now, Comcast, on the other hand, I think um, we're, some of the, 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 the issues they're having right now are things that are in its control and some things that aren't in its control. Uh, I think the pandemic has, um, you know, put a lot of stress on kind of the NBCU part of the portfolio with, you know, parks being closed and and uh, what's going on with the movie theaters. Um, you know, I, I just don't think um, even before the pandemic, they weren't getting a lot of credit for that piece of their business. So just as from a service provider standpoint, you know, I think uh, you know, Charter has the advantage because it's a lot less, their business is a, lot, is a lot less complicated right now. Okay, thanks so much, uh, Jeff. Uh, thank you sure. for the next uh, presentation. Yep. Uh, we're, uh, stick around for as long as you like. Uh, if you have to go do something and want to come back in to the conference later, you're welcome to. Uh, but it's been a, a super pleasure to have you uh, with us uh, uh, this year. And uh, again, great job. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks, guys. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Larry. All right.